Ever since I was a little girl, I've always had an affection for fantasy television shows. And one of my fondest memories I have as a child is watching cartoons with my sister. Her and I would be glued to the TV for hours, watching shows like The Powerpuff Girls, Scooby-Doo, and Pokemon. But out of the many programs we bonded over, my favorites were always the magical girl shows. A day never went by with us watching at least one of them. From watching Sailor Moon as we ate our breakfast and got ready for school, to later coming home and tuning into Witch, to me even setting an alarm early Saturday morning just to make sure I wouldn't miss the latest episode of Winx Club. I've always had a soft spot for the magical girl genre. Back then, I would get lost in my own imagination, with fanciful thoughts of what I would do if I suddenly woke up with magic powers, or how I'd live a double life as a regular schoolgirl by day, but fighting crime by night. Now while I may have grown past the stage of believing that I myself have superpowers that are hidden inside me, just waiting to be unlocked, I still have a love for the magical girl content. And when I found out that there would be an Atome game releasing this year, centered around just that, and that those magical girls are actually your male love interests? Well, to say I was intrigued would be a bit of an understatement. In today's video, we're going to take a look at Axis's newest Atome, Paradigm Paradox. This game was originally released in Japan in May of 2021, and it was one of the handful of localizations Axis brought to the West this year. Please keep in mind this video may contain minor spoilers for the game, so if you would like to go into this title completely blind, then feel free to click out of this video now. Alright, let's begin. Paradigm Paradox follows our main character, Yuki, a high school student living in an artificially created colony called Theta, as life outside the colony has been deemed inhabitable. Yuki lives an ordinary life day by day with the same routine, mostly consisting of going to class and hanging out with her best friend Lizze. But one night, certain events lead to her being outside past curfew, and she finds herself face to face with a monster known as a Vector. Just when Yuki thinks all hope is lost, four female superheroes swoop in to save the day, and as events unfold, she ultimately finds herself joining this team of heroes. From then on, Yuki's life is anything but ordinary as she adjusts to her recently acquired powers, faces new enemies, and learns many new secrets about both Theta and the world outside the colony. Now let's take a look at the 8 love interests you can pursue in this game. These 8 characters are divided up into two categories, the heroes and the villains. Let's start off with the heroes. First up, we have Mihaya, a fellow student one year Yuki's junior. He tends to keep to himself in the library, and although other girls have tried speaking to him, the conversations never seem to last long. He transforms into Mocha, who is one of the superheroes Yuki joins forces with. Next up is the student council president, Ayumu. He is loved by many and is said to have everything, looks, grades, and athleticism. He transforms into Haruka, one of Yuki's fellow superheroes. Moving on, we have Tokyo, a known genius at school and a fellow member of the superhero team. Rumor has it that he's so talented academically that he has complete access to the research facility. Despite only being a student, he transforms into Kaori. Finally, from the superhero group, we have Kamui, the supposed playboy on campus. Although he's been given this title by his peers, he's actually very kind and will do whatever he can to put a smile on someone's face. He transforms into Sena. Now we move on to the villains of this game. First up is Yukinami. He has a very childlike personality and is always constantly seeking Yuki's attention, even going to drastic measures such as attacking her, just so he can see different expressions from her. Next is Hyuga. Not much is known about him in the prologue, except for the fact that he despises all humans, which you'll uncover his reason during his route. P.S. I think this man has one of the best character designs in the entire game. There's a certain je ne sais quoi about a man wearing a white shirt, running his fingers through his hair that makes me weak in the knees. Anyone else get this? No? Okay, moving on! Next is the leader of the villains, Ibuki. He is another character shrouded in mystery right from the prologue, mainly because Yuki only encounters him when he's in his alternate form as Moravia. He seems to be able to control the vectors and leads them to Theta for attacks. But what is his end goal? And what is it that he's fighting for? Finally, we have Ryo, 
He is the logistics support team for the Blooms, the name of the superhero team. But you'll often find him wandering the school grounds in disguise as one of the school's maintenance staff. Now originally, I thought he was going to be a part of the heroes team, but when I made a choice while conversing with him and I saw that villain meter rise, I was like, oh ho ho, et tu brute? He is yet another character with an air of mystery about him, and not much is known until his route is unlocked at the very end of the game. Each love interest has three main endings, a happy, a normal, and a bad ending, along with a few extra bad endings spread throughout the game. The only locked routes in the game are Ibuki, whose route will unlock mid-game, Ryo's route, who will unlock after you completed the seventh route, and the grand finale will unlock once you've completed all eight love interests. Although this game has quite a large roster, I found that all the routes were quite short. Even with me listening to the voice acting, it only took me about three hours max to complete each route. I ended up completing the game with around 30 hours total of playtime. Now I don't necessarily think that short routes are a bad thing, but I do find that titles with shorter routes tend to be more fast paced, which unfortunately leads to stories that lack in both story and character development. This isn't the first time I ran into this problem, because I felt the same way when it came to Nor 9. While I do appreciate routes that aren't bloated with needless filler information, I do wish this game went more in depth with the love interests. I want to know more about them, why they behave a certain way, why they do what they do. I feel like I only saw the surface level of most characters, and when they did get deep into their past, their explanations felt so rushed that I didn't really have time to sit there and let all the new information sink in before I was quickly thrown into the next scene. Now although the routes themselves are short, one positive about this game is that it has a lot of unlockable goodies. Throughout the game, you'll unlock reports, which you can later find in the activity report section on the homepage. These reports are extra scenes of the characters, and you'll unlock the little interviews with each of the love interests, which I thought was a cute little reward for finishing each route. There are multiple pages of these extras, so while I do think the main routes are quite short, these unlockables will leave you in no short supply of extra content. One thing that I always have a hard time with in Atome games is the love catch system, but this game has one of my favorite systems that I've ever used. During the prologue, when you make a decision, you'll see a DNA looking strand that'll either turn pink for the heroes or teal for the villains. Later on, when you get into each character's route, there will be two status gauges that you have to look at your ability use, and your affection for the love interest, which will be shown as a percentage. If you made a positive decision for the affection gauge, you'll see flowers appear on the screen. And if you made a decision to affect your ability, you'll see the DNA strand appear. This system was super simple to use, and it helped me easily complete each suitor's route, which I much prefer than blindly guessing and praying to the Atome gods that I've made a right choice, which nine times out of 10, I don't. <laughs> Another great thing about this game is it has a flowchart that allows you to easily navigate through each route. It even tells you where a bad end is located, and it'll let you jump to any chapter if you're looking to unlock a certain ending. I'm proud to announce that this is the first Atome I was able to 100% complete without a walkthrough, and that should speak volumes. If I, Natalie, the woman who found herself getting a bad ending even while using a detailed walkthrough? Don't even ask me how I did that, I still don't even know. If I can finish this game with no problem, then so can you. So in regards to this game's playing system, it gets an A plus from me. Although I introduced the love interests earlier on in the game, I want to backtrack and talk about a couple of things mainly a few certain characters. Now while I do appreciate a game with variety, which this title has a lot of, there are some characters that I wish I could have skipped on. But because you are required to complete all the happy endings to unlock the finale, I was left struggling through some routes. Specifically, Ayumu, Yukinami, and Ryo. In Ayumu's route, you very quickly discover that his personality is not as pleasant as the public think. And the way he treated Yuki throughout the majority of his route made me want to grab him by the collar and say, listen up, you little snot rag. <laughs> I've honestly never been more infuriated by a character before, but oh boy, does this man take the cake. Which angers me to no end because I thought he had some of the best CGs. 
In the case of Yukinami, I found his route to be extremely lackluster. After finishing it, I quickly went to my notes to jot down what had happened, and that's when I realized that a whole lot of nothing happened in his route. Not enough to keep me interested, anyway. Finally, with Ryo's route, it just left me with an icky taste in my mouth. In the game, Yuki is 16 years old and Ryo is 26. That alone is giving me alarm bells. And I know that the main focus of this game isn't the romantic aspect, but there is a specific scene where Ryo makes some implications towards the situation he and Yuki are in. And you can tell that she is worried, borderline scared, and that alone put me off of his route. Nothing else in his story redeemed himself after that, and I tried to speedrun his route just so I could move on. I honestly think the writers could have just combined his route with the grand finale as a side story, and it would have played out just as well, if not better. As per usual from Ultimate, the voice actors are great, and the female cast for the superheroes did a great job too, although I will admit it would have been hilarious to hear the male leads just pitch their voice higher when they transform, but you know what, I'm glad they went with the female voice actor route. <laughs> As for the music and art in this game, I think they complement Paradigm Paradox perfectly. The art gives off a very comic book anime vibe, and pair that with the upbeat battle music, it fits the superhero theme to a T. I can't do a review without discussing who were my favorite love interests, and there were about five of them that I enjoyed, but I'm going to narrow it down to one hero and one villain. From the hero side, it would have to be Tokyo. I loved watching him and Yuki warm up to each other. Tokyo always approaches things with a scientific point of view, and seeing him slowly discover his feelings for Yuki was extremely heartwarming. Now for my favorite love interest from the villain side, it would have to be Ibuki. His story gave me a true ending feeling with a lot of revelations unfolding, and I thought Yuki had some of the best personal growth in his route. As Yuki learns more about her past and life outside the colony, she comes to realize that she has so much more in common with the people she once thought of as villains. I'd also like to take this moment to talk about our main protagonist herself, Yuki. In the long run, she's not the most memorable main character, but she has an immeasurable amount of kindness in her that I deeply respect. She's always willing to lend a hand to those who need it. She's not afraid to stand up to those who are treating others unfairly. And even if she's confronting her adversaries, she understands that there's two sides to every story, and she views each and every situation with an open mind. I think everyone can take a page out of Yuki's book, and for that, she holds a special place in my heart. You may be wondering if there's a specific root order that you have to play, and in my personal opinion, I don't think there is. The only suggestion I would make is to mix it up with your love interests. I played all the heroes first and then the villains, and I kind of wish I shuffled a few roots around for variety's sake. So if I had to give my own recommended root order, it would be as followed. Kamui, Mihaya, Yukinami, Hyuga, Ayamu, Tokyo, Ibuki, Ryo, and then finally the grand finale. Now overall, what are my final thoughts on the game? <sighs> This game leaves me feeling so conflicted. On one hand, I love a good handful of the characters, but I've also never come across characters as aggravating as some of them are in this title. There were some routes that I thought were very well done, but others slipped through the cracks and became forgettable nothing by the end game. The game is relatively short, so it was a nice break from all the lengthy Atome I've played recently. However, some routes were so short that they tried to cram in as much information as they could, and it left me feeling overwhelmed at times. Also, they barely even touched on the fact that these boys turn into females when they use their powers. Like, huh? Can we please elaborate on this? I need to know the science behind this. I want to see the case studies, because that side effect is absolutely bonkers. <laughs> I don't think this game will appeal to everyone, but it does have its own unique charm that left me satisfied by the finale. I also can't deny that I have a soft spot for the magical girl theme, and this game does go about it in a very interesting way with its gender-bending love interests. Will I play this game again? If I'm being completely honest, I think if I ever did play it again, it would probably only be for Ibuki and Tokyo's roots, because those are really the only two that stand out to me. Do I think this is the best Atome to come out this year? No. But did I still have a fun time playing this game? Yes. You'll never catch me saying that I regret playing this game. Now who would I recommend this game to? 
I think this would be a good Atome for beginners. There's plenty of love interests to choose from, so there's bound to be someone for everyone. The system is also very straightforward and easy to grasp, so navigating through it would be a piece of cake for novice Atome players. I would also recommend this game if you're looking for a sci-fi Atome. It's not very often we get games with a sci-fi theme. In fact, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head would be Nor 9. So if you're looking for more titles of that genre, then definitely consider picking this one up. If you're not a big fan of more mature otomes that deal with heavy themes, then I think this game would be a good alternative. Although Paradigm Paradox does have its darker moments, overall, on the somber spectrum, I find it to be quite mild. And pair that with its high school setting, I think it would appeal to first-time otome players, and younger players looking to get into the genre. As it is set in high school, the romance in this game is very innocent and reminiscent of a first crush. So if you're looking for something that's not as hot and heavy as Olympia Soiree or Pio Fiore, then this would be a good recommendation. Finally, I would also recommend this to players who would prefer a shorter story, as each route only takes a couple of hours to complete. Now who wouldn't I recommend this title to? If you prefer a more mature title, such as Call or Malice, then I would say this game isn't for you. If you're looking for a game that delivers the same in-depth plot experience as games like Pio Fiore, then it would be best to look elsewhere. And if you much prefer longer titles so you can become fully immersed in the world, I would steer clear of this game. If you're like me and are considered a seasoned Atome player at this point, you might find this game as a little bit of a letdown. But in the end, I'm still happy that I've added this title to my collection. If you've reached this far in the video and are still on the fence about buying this game, what I would recommend doing is checking out a Let's Play for the prologue, and then see if that piques your interest during that time. If it does, then I would go ahead and say give it a go. And last but not least, if I had to give this title a rating, Paradigm Paradox would get a 6 out of 10 from me. So I hope this video helped you decide whether or not to pick up this game. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you guys as soon as I can. If you did enjoy this video, I would really appreciate it if you gave it a like, and if you would like to stick around and see more from me, then please feel free to subscribe. This title is undeniably one of the most unique Atomes to come out this year. And if you're anything like me, and were also drawn in by the magical girl concept, then Paradigm Paradox is definitely a title to keep your eyes on.